Anderson. Uh, as uh, Yane has said, please put them in the chat room and we will get to as many as we can. Now I'll turn this over to Dr. Joan Gunderson to enlighten us on the life of Constance Baker Motley. Well, the person that I'm going to talk about today, Constance Baker Motley, unlike the other women that you'll hear about, did not do her work in the church, but the church was a major factor in her formation and thus the work that she would do seeking justice. Constance Juanita Baker was born in September 1921, the ninth of 12 children of Willoughby Alva Baker and Rachel Huggins Baker. Now the Bakers were immigrants from the island of Nevis. He arrived single in 1906. She arrived single in 1907. His family had been Anglicans for several generations on the island of Nevis, which is part of the small country of St. Kitts and Nevis. They are from the fig tree area right down in this bottom part here. And they attended St. John's Episcopal Church there, an Anglican church there. He had served as a sexton at the church before immigrating. Her family was a combination of Anglican and Methodist. Willoughby, the father, which is, who incidentally is misnamed in the Wikipedia uh, story on her, on Constance Baker Motley. And that misnaming of him is picked up in piece after piece after piece on the internet. But Willoughby found work in New Haven, Connecticut as a chef at the Yale Student Club, The Skull and Crossbones, which is one of the ones that has, I think something like seven presidents they claim as past members. Uh, at that time, not all of them, were, there weren't seven yet, but there were certainly, it was very prestigious place to work. Why did he try this line and go into the Yale clubs? Well, his brother was already working at a club. Here is the club, Skull and Bones, club that her father worked at, his brother worked at the fences. Her mother was active in the community and I have here her obituary because it, it lists, it's one of the very few things we have that actually documents her. Um, but even yet, if this is a three, theme that I found is that there is wrong information about Motley sitting out on the web. Here in her New York Times obituary, they'd cut 20 years off of her age and have her at 66 rather than 86, which is how old she was when she did that. Her mother was active, as I said, in the community, including in the St. Luke's Episcopal Church in New Haven and was a founding member of the New Haven NAACP in 1917. Now with nine children to raise because of the 12, three died very young, money was tight even if you had a steady employment like Willoughby did. So, but they did in fact have a, a good sized home. This is. This is the home that she grew up in from about age eight on, and uh, it still exists in New Haven. Here is Constance and her older sister. Constance was taller. Connie was taller than her sister Eunice. As well, about the age they would have been when they moved into that house. The family kept largely to a community and a group of friends and relatives all from the West Indies. They had very little to do with that part of the black population, only 2% of New Haven's population was black. They had very little to do with that part of the population that had experienced American slavery in their background or their uh, grandparents or great grandparents. And because the population was so small in New Haven, Motley, Constance grew up 
in what seemed to her to be an integrated community. This is her junior high that she attended, Troop Junior High. Here is Connie in her seventh grade picture. The arrow points right down onto her. If you look, you can see just exactly if she is a minority within that classroom by far. She, it's a spot of color in a sea of whiteness. Here's, you've got one other person over here of color, color, and down here, and that's it. Her high school was also integrated in that same way. There simply weren't enough African Americans to make it worthwhile or to try to se segregate. And here is the high school that she attended. And here is her senior yearbook. Her Eunice, her sister, who was a year older, actually ended up in the same grade she was because uh, for various reasons. And so they are both uh, here in the book. They later, obviously, these signatures were added later because they have their married last names on them. By the time Connie was 15, she had uh, decided to become a lawyer. And the reason for that was that she had been at age 15, denied access to one of the two beaches in that part of Connecticut on the basis of her race. And it so surprised her and shocked her and humiliated her that she decided she wanted to do something about it when she grew up. And what could she do? Well, she could become a lawyer and therefore she could change the laws or ch and change the rules. If you look really carefully at this slide, you can see that what her future is, is college, law school. So by the time she was a senior in, in high school, she had already decided on a career in law. Now, also very influential in her back, in her formation, is this place, St. Luke's Episcopal Church in New Haven. It was New Haven's Episcop Black Episcopal Church. It had been founded in 1844. Among the people that were the founders were the grand, was the grandfather of W.E.B. Du Bois. This parish became a source of community. It was where she saw women being active. It is where she was taught to do justice and care about your neighbor. It is where she grew up in a West, in a culture that was an interesting one. And in her high school years with a new rector where she learned African-American history and the past that she had not heard in school or from her West Indian family. Now, Connie is probably somewhere in this picture because it was taken in the early 30s and late 20s in that, right at that period. And she would have been a somewhere in these children, these girls down here, but I haven't been able to figure out which one she might be. The parish was about a third West Indian in origin. And with the rest coming from the American Black community, Native American community, and some whites who had actually married into that community. The women were extremely active through their guilds in parish life, and they gave her support and role models. But notice all these robes. This is an Anglo-Catholic parish. And because of that at that time, it had very little connection to things like African-American music. They didn't know anything at all about spirituals. She didn't learn about those until her, one of her older sisters attended college at St. Augustine College in North Carolina and came back talking about this other kind of music they'd never heard before. When she graduated in 1939 from high school, there was no way that her family had the money to send her to college. And so she got a job in one of the New Deal administration kinds of op, uh, operations. She actually did some sewing under the New, New Deal and she worked with community action groups, a youth group that she had been president of since her high school years and as secretary for the adult group. In addition, she spent a lot of time at two community centers that were close to her. One was Welcome Hall, and the other was the Dixwell Community House. 
these places gave her more images of professional women. In this case, actually white women who worked on the staff uh, providing services to the black communities that were there. And most importantly, it was at these settlement houses that she came into contact with Clarence Blakesley. Actually, he was impressed by her when she spoke up at a community meeting and criticized the way that the settlement hall house was actually approaching public, uh, their services to the black community. Because what she was arguing is that whites were telling blacks what they needed rather than asking Blacks what they needed. And he was so impressed that he asked for a meeting with her and he asked what she wanted to do and why she wasn't in college. And she explained she didn't have the money and was working to save the money so she could start college. Well, he had already sent at least one African-American young man to college and he decided that he told her he would sponsor her through her entire education. And he paid for every cent of her college education and her law school. So two years out of high school in 1941, Watley went off to Fisk University. Fisk it was chosen because it had a strong reputation among black colleges and Motley wanted to experience life in a black majority community. But she got more than she bargained for because of course it is in the South. And even on her way to a register at Fisk, she faced her uh, instances of segregation when on the train she was told she had to change cars because they were entering the South and she had to go into a different car. She lasted a year at Fisk, but these she found suffering the segregation so suffocating that she wanted to move back into the North. Now she applied, she'd hoped to go, and Blakesley had hoped for her to go to the female coordinate college for Columbia, the Ivy League, that would have been Barnard. But Barnard had already accepted their quota of two black women per class. And so she, two was all they would admit into an, any given year. And so she could not go that to Barnard and she went to New York University, NYU. Now she arrived there in 1942 and she graduated in 1943 and she had not started college until 1941. So this woman was a woman in a hurry to catch up and who did her undergraduate studies in record time uh, in the field of economics. When she finished in 43, she was admitted to Columbia Law School. Now Columbia had only admitted a few women before. It was very new in, in admitting any women, but by 1943, we are in the middle of World War II and there is something called the draft. And because men are disappearing from the ranks of those able to go to law school and because Columbia wanted to have the tuition that came from having students, they were admitting a handful of women in each class. And it was a handful, but it was more than one. She was actually surprised to find that there were going to be a few women in her class. She graduated from Columbia in 1946. Now, while she spent those years at NYU and Columbia, much of that time, she lived at a YWCA that was open to black, uh, that provided housing for black women in, in New York. Just down the road a little bit was a YMCA that was doing the same thing for African-American men. And they often had social events. At one of those, she met Joel Motley Jr. And they also married in 1946 at St. Luke's in Connecticut. And here is her wedding picture. Before she even got married or finished her graduate, her graduate law studies, she had been hired as an intern by the NAACP, by Sergeant Marshall, to work as an intern in the Legal Defense Fund area. This is 
the staff of the NAACP in 1945. And this woman is the secretary to Thurgood Marshall. They had nothing, it was all male lawyers. That isn't really surprising, however, because in all of the United States in 1946, there were a total of 57 black women lawyers, including Connie. They almost immediately began sending her often with another one of the NAACP lawyers into the field. She would draft briefs, complaints, original filings. She would make arguments in court. She would do depositions and she was bouncing all over the United States doing this. For example, in 1948, I don't have a picture of this one because there were the newspaper clippings I couldn't uh, condense enough to make it worthwhile. In 1948, Marshall, was sent, Marshall sent her to Jackson, Mississippi with Robert Carter to handle a teacher pay equalization case that was going on in Jackson, filed by Gladys Noel Bates, an African-American teacher who was making less than half of what any white teacher made in this in the school district. And Bates had a master's degree from West Virginia. Motley presented the case before the federal judge Mize. And in fact, that case, that's her introduction to judge Mize whom she will run into time and time again in uh, Mississippi uh, over the next 15 years. She and Carter, uh, Robert Carter who went down with her did the research necessary to show tremendous pay disparities. And while the case did not go forward, and in part because uh, Bates was fired as a teacher at the end of the year for daring to sue, her, she and her husband was also fired from his job at the local black college. And they had gunshots through the windows of their house and their house was burned to the ground. They and they were blacklisted so they could not work anywhere else in Mississippi because she had filed this lawsuit. They eventually would move to Colorado. Today in Jackson, there is a school named for that woman, for uh, Gladys Bates. Motley presented, presented the case. The case went nowhere, but the evidence that they put forward in that case was strong enough that Mississippi began to raise teachers, black teachers salaries because they realized because of other work that the NAACP was doing that they needed to make separate actually equal or they would not be able to keep segregation. The NAACP, others of the kinds of cases she got here is one it was a court martial and she was uh, asking for clemency uh, and uh, because in fact, it's not even clear that the guy did what they convicted him of. This one, that was uh, in New York. Let's see, the, and this one is in South Carolina. She was making the arguments in court there in 1948 to get compensation for the family of a man who was lynched. These, she, had, she was in all sorts of states all over the place. What's in the middle is the other kind of work she did for the NAACP. She actually would often draft initial arguments, briefs, documents, and so forth. And one of those was the original filing in Brown versus the Board of Education. And her name is listed on the official brief to the Supreme Court. She's right there in the list of the NAACP lawyers and, and the lawyers from the individual case of, out in, uh, to, in, in Topeka on that particular one. So what she faced in these various places that she went was that she was often like exhibit A herself. Black community would come out in force to see a New York lawyer, black, argue in front of a white Southern judge and actually stand up to him. And then to find that it was a woman and the idea that a woman was even a lawyer and that woman was a black lawyer was uh, something that would bring out large, she was on display everywhere she went. 
because it was uh, so unusual to have that happen. In many of these Southern states, there were only one or two members of the bar who were actually African-American. So it was a very rare thing and it caused a lot of attention in the black communities where she went. She also had to deal with judges who would, for example, close their eyes whenever a black lawyer spoke. Uh, one judge that turned his back and faced the wall rather than look at them. Uh, another judge regularly scheduled cases. Uh, it didn't matter where you were on the docket for the day, if it was an African-American plaintiff or an African-American lawyer, you were, your case was handled last, putting you in what the judge considered the proper order of things. She did not take to these things easily. And there is a case that I found in the, written up in one of the newspapers. She was in Dayton, Ohio for an NAACP youth conference where she and some of the NAACP lawyers were going to obviously uh, present, talk to the students that were there and various things. And they went into one of the restaurant bar to get a drink. The NAACP group was mixed race. Motley was the only woman. The, the waiters refused to serve them drinks. When Motley protested, one of the waiters slugged her. And then they physically dragged the whole party out of the restaurant, calling the police to have that have the party arrested. Instead, she demanded that the police arrest the waiters for assault. And she made enough of a stink that the waiters lost their jobs and the restaurant apologized. And in fact, they were uh, actually arrested for assault after the fact. By 1954, she was an experienced, skilled trial attorney and a litigator. And they began to see that she had a special strength in litigation. So they would send her in in multiple occasions, but now they began, they began to give her bigger cases. In particular, she became the lead attorney that was on site in Alabama for authoring Lucy, who was the first of a series of students over time who would try to integrate the University of Alabama. She, uh, had a friend who was also going to applied with her, but that friend uh, was dropped out because of some personal issues that meant that the, the university had other grounds for denying her admission. But uh, authoring Lucy persisted. It goes up and down the courts. As you can see here, Motley is, this is a press conference. Arthur Shores is the local uh, black attorney that is also involved. The NAACP would almost always partner with a local attorney who was a member of the bar in that state so that, that because the filings had to be done by a, a member of the bar. She did, Lucy did get far enough that she was actually registered. She went to, to go to class, that there were riots of students and others that night. Uh, she was expelled for her own safety, suspended for her own safety, according to the university. When they got that suspension taken care of, and she came back after multiple court cases to get the suspension taken off, uh, the university turned around and expelled her for libeling the university in the statements that she had made under while doing her depositions when she was under oath. And here is Motley and authoring Lucy as they are being escorted through a rank of policemen to uh, out of town, basically. Now, what you will see in many of the accounts of authoring Lucy are lots of pictures of Thurgood Marshall who would drop in every so often to do big arguments. And, but then the rest of the time, it was uh, Motley that was down there doing the work. So this pattern continues. Robert Carter 
and Motley will find themselves sent and working in the field, making multiple trips, laying all sorts of groundwork, doing the uh, multiple levels of filing, answers of briefs, getting doing the initial trial. And when, it, when the case got worked its way up, then Thurgood Marshall would come in to uh, be a part of it. And that's, that's a typical kind of large, a, a way a law firm might work sometimes. But that means also that her work is, is sometimes very hidden. So by the time we are finally through all of this, and we get to around 1963, Motley's still the only woman on the NAACP staff, but now she's in the center and she's actually going to be directing it. And I want to get us to that kind of point over time. In 1961, uh, Motley will serve on a number of other cases, um, including Little Rock. She's there. there I'll, I'll get to some of these in just a minute. But the case that she's famous for is the James Meredith case. And one of the reasons she has that case is that by this point, Thurgood Marshall has moved on to a federal appointment. And he is no longer with the NAACP. And she assumed all of his caseload. She will, and here um, the Meredith case went up and down the courts multiple times in Mississippi. And, and you can see her reading, this is, this is some of the correspondence that came in from people writing about the Meredith case, letters that came in. Here she is with James Meredith uh, headed to a court hearing. Here she is on the steps of the courtrooms with, with white protesters on either side of her. They're basically holding signs that say JFK is a communist and other such wonderful uh, statements. Over the next, over the first part of the 1960s, she will desegregate a number of major universities at the undergraduate level, including the University of Alabama, where Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes will be admitted and will graduate. And there's their graduation picture. That's Charlene Hunter Galt, the journalist. Uh, Holmes became a doctor. Harvey Gant at Clemson in South Carolina, Vivian Malone and James Hood at the University of Georgia. She was the lead attorney in all of those. Some of those you may remember, they made big news. In the meantime though, she would be involved in the civil rights movement in other ways. When this, because by 1960, after the Montgomery bus boycott, increasingly there were examples of mass action and mass protest. And that took on a new life in 1960 with the reinstitution of sit-ins and freedom rides, both of which actually had been tried in the 1940s. But, uh, on a much larger scale with in the 1960s. And while Thurgood Marshall was actually not very pleased by this action because it upset kind of an orderly progression through uh, a legal dismantling of segregation, um, Motley was willing to go in and take, the, take cases. And so for example, here in Columbia, Missouri, you have a somebody who sat in at one of the uh, drugstore lunch counters being arrested. And uh, she would take his case and a case of another, uh, some other, his case, he had four other people with him. There are two that were arrested a week later. Those cases will go all the way to the Supreme Court and she will argue them there. If, uh, but if you actually read the historical markers, nowhere does that say anything about her. It's all, it is about the guys that were, arrested at that point. She bounces all over the South in at least 11 different states she is trying cases. And they are of all different kinds. She actually was one of the people arguing the case in the Montgomery bus boycott, a background case that went to the Supreme Court that eventually declared that uh, the bus systems had to be had to be desegregated that they involved state action, public action. 
the protests in Albany, Mississippi, which were designed in, in 1961 to um, uh, desegregate the town in a variety of ways. She, was, she came in several times to get protesters out of jail. In Little Rock, she and Robert Carter did all of the background work. She stayed with Daisy Bates, who was the person who organized the group of Little Rock Nine and uh, that were the actual young people and their families who challenged the system. And, uh, in, and she went into Selma. And when Martin was, when first John Lewis was going to lead a march from Selma to Montgomery, uh, and they were beaten on March 7th, then King came in on the 9th and he led another march. There was an injunction placed against them. So they stopped at Pettus Bridge and did not, and turned around. King had him turn around and go back rather than get arrested that day. She's the one that went into court and got the injunction lifted so that eventually the march could take place from Selma to Montgomery. But another of the big ones is Birmingham. And this it will illustrate several things. Uh, Constance Baker Motley was in Birmingham because of the University of Alabama cases, the Vivian Malone, uh, James Hood, trying to get in uh, to the University of Alabama. While she's there, the major movement that is, is taking place, the demonstrations trying to desegregate the stores and uh, facilities in the downtown area of Birmingham. They are Birmingham. They're being meet, met by Bull O'Connor with his fire hoses, police dogs, and violence. When they ran out of adults to basically get arrested, and they had several uh, hundreds of them that were now scattered in various jails, including um, Martin Luther King Jr. Ralph Abernathy and Fred Shuttlesworth, all of whom are arrested at various times during these demonstrations. There was an, there was an effort to enlist younger people. And so we have the Children's Crusade. And we have, this is a picture of some of the children who were marching, who are being arrested. Notice the age of the little girl. They arrest the students in such large numbers that they were using uh, gymnasiums as holding pens until they could send them out to the state fairgrounds. Picture of one of them. So what does she do? Well, in between filing and making the arguments on the University of Alabama, she files the document that gets King out of the Birmingham jail that gets the students, students after they were arrested, the school district retaliated by expelling, by suspending uh, 1,100 of them. And she went to court, this is in May, the kids are almost ready to graduate, the seniors that were in that group. They aren't gonna be able to go to college if they don't get their degree, the graduation. She goes to court, and she gets the suspensions and expulsions reversed. And they are back in school. In order to do that, she had to file the motions that she needed to in, uh, in Jackson and then make a 90 mile dash to reach a judge who held his court open after hours so that they could make a motion there on the demonstrators. And uh, this is somehow she managed to keep all of these cases straight. Sometimes there were as many as four and five cases, different cases that would be scheduled for the same day with the same federal judges. And the clerks were doing that because they recognized that she was going to be the person arguing all of them. And it would, she, they were making it as compact for her as they could. But, if you can imagine keeping all of these very, very serious and sometimes very technical 
questions that were being asked separate. That's what she was doing on the site in these trial litigations. And what she was especially good at, apparently, was getting white supremacists to admit their bias by the way she managed to approach it and they would just trip right over it, among other things. So what we have is a record where she participated at some level, trial level, appellate level, filing briefs, motions, depositions, whatever, in 57 cases that eventually went to the US Supreme Court that had to most, almost all of them in civil rights. Of those, she would make arguments in front of the Supreme Court in 10 of them. She also is basically serving as Martin Luther King's personal lawyer to get him out of jail for every time after time after time, or to get an injunction released. Here he is in Albany. This is in Atlanta. She went there. This is him in the Birmingham jail. Um, this, this person just irritated her the life, life out of her because Kunstler tried cut his way into cases claiming he was uh, King's attorney on several occasions when he wasn't. And he had, they got into court in Albany and he was going, he got up first and was going to introduce Motley to the judge as though he knew her, knew the judge and she would not. And the judge cut him off and basically told him, look, she's here so often, she's a it's almost like she's a member of the court. We don't need an introduction. And here he is with, here she is with uh, Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King at a banquet in 65 for uh, in honor of Rosa Parks. The 10 cases that she argued, here they are, that went to all the way to the Supreme Court. The Meredith case went there, Meredith um, versus Fair, and then it became Meredith versus University of Mississippi. There are also cases that had to do with criminal justice issues and unfairness towards blacks. Uh, this one, the right to the council at arraignment. In that particular, in Alabama, arraignments were important because if you didn't raise certain legal issues there, you couldn't bring them up in your defense later. That's not the case in every state, but it was in, in the cases in, in Alabama. There are cases where she's defending the people who were uh, trying to desegregate the, the counters. This is a sit-in. This was a case where the city had not, was opening its park facilities, you know, like one park a year. Um, this is part of the Birmingham protests. Atlanta was going to put forward a desegregation plan that would take 12 years to implement because they would integrate one one grade level a year. And she argued that that was a little too deliberate speed and that in fact it needed to move much faster and the Supreme Court ended the idea, basically ended the idea of deliberate speed. Okay, guys, you've had long enough, get this done. More sit-ins, these are the ones uh, that were actually on the uh, historical marker earlier. And the last case, of the 10 cases she argued, the decisions by the Supreme Court, nine of them sided with her arguments. The 10th one, Swain versus Alabama, involved, again, a criminal justice issue. In this case, the elimination of all Blacks from juries that were trying Blacks um, by the use of preemptory challenges. And she argued that it was being done uh, with a racial bias to, in order to get away from the idea of, uh, and get back to an all white jury to try a black defendant. At that time, she lost at the Supreme Court. They followed an earlier precedent, but 20 years later in another case, they will reverse the earlier decision and basically using the same line of logic that Motley had put forward 20 years before.
at that point, we are in the middle 60s. She has been shocked by the death of the, of the four girls in Birmingham and the church bombing, by the, the assassination of Medgar Evers, whom she had stayed with many, many times. And in fact, her son had even stayed with Medgar Evers. And so she decided to stop traveling for the NAACP. Um, Marshall was gone. She'd done this work now for 20 years. And she went into politics in New York. She was asked to fill in as a candidate after the Democrats' original candidate for a special election had to withdraw because of personal, uh, <laughs> personal embarrassments. And she won the election. She thus became the first African-American woman to sit in the New York State Senate. Here she is with Governor Rockefeller. She also got caught in politics between a rivalry between Bobby Wagner and Bobby Kennedy. And uh, that actually resulted in slowing down the next stage of her career, another stage of her career that we'll get to in a minute. After a year there, she ended up running for the Manhattan Borough president. And she became the first African-American woman to serve as president in the Manhattan Borough. And here is she sworn in and doing her various duties. That didn't last long because Lyndon Baines Johnson as president invited her to the White House. And a nomination for her to federal court as a judge which had been sitting for a long period of time, basically dormant, he had decided to go through with. He didn't tell her. She thought she was going to discuss whether she might be a judge. She got to the White House and he told her, I'm announcing it today and we're gonna be, the professor's waiting outside for you. However, having announced it, it took seven months to get her approved because she, uh, she had to get the approval of the Senate and the head of this committee that judicial nominations went through was Senator Eastland of Mississippi, one of the diehard white supremacists of all time. And he managed to drag it out for seven months. And in fact, Bobby Kennedy was also on there on that same committee and he did nothing to speed it up. At any rate, they were, what they were claiming is that because she was a woman and because she was black, she would be biased in her decisions. She would always favor women and blacks. Apparently, if you were a male or white, those weren't considered bias factors. Although obviously in a discrimination case, uh, whites and males might also have a stake in the game. But she got approved. She joined a court in Southern District of New York for the district, Federal District Court. When she did so, she became the first African-American woman to be appointed a federal court judge of any level. There were only three other women of any race in any part of, uh, as a judge of federal courts. So now she's there, if you'll notice, you see the sea of guys and you see a spot of female color right there in the middle. That is that. And they weren't really used to, they really didn't think through what they were going to have to do. They held some of their meetings at all men's clubs. They had to do things like take her to the floor above on an elevator and have her run down the back stairs. They introduced her as the secretary, taking notes to get her into another location. Um, and there were all sorts of other things in which women were not given the same respect, women lawyers were not given the same status and in which the New York bar acted like a men's club in general. And she talks about some of that as part of what she, <laughs> what she found that she faced as she got on court. Now her record on the court shows that she in fact handled each case on its own merits. And in fact, she did not consistently rule for women or blacks or in favor of fair housing or the things, the causes that she had fought for in the rest of her career. They had to have the legal case in place. And this became an issue 
here. In Blank versus Sullivan and Cromwell, it was a classic glass ceiling case involving a major law firm. And the women were not getting those salaries or appointed as a partner, although promised that. What happened is that she was under tremendous, Motley was under tremendous pressure to recuse herself because as a woman black lawyer, she would obviously be biased. She refused. And the opinion that she wrote on the motion to have her recused is a defense of her own judicial career as uh, someone who had been fair to all sides and did, could not be predicted based on identity politics. The case itself, when, the, when she didn't recruit herself and then they, the law firm took a look at it, it was better to settle than it was to keep litigating. And so it didn't go beyond the district court. The other case that she took of note that uh, I want to talk about very briefly is the case of Melissa Ludke, who was a sports writer, sports illustrated reporter, and wanted to interview people in the New York Yankees locker room. That case also, uh, this case, she tried all the way through and she ruled in favor of Melissa Ludke. And it is one of the major cases opening the locker room to women reporters in the same way that it was open to men. Eventually, she would be the chief judge of the district. She would also then retire and become a senior judge. She would spend time in her Connecticut home. They had a second home that they bought in Connecticut, Joel and she did. They went back and forth between New York and on the weekends, Connecticut close to New Haven. And that's the way she spent her last years of her life. She died two weeks after her 84th birthday from congestive heart failure. Her funeral was at St. Luke's Episcopal Church. And although people then acknowledged her as a crusader for civil rights, she has continued to be written out of the histories of uh, many of these areas. So that's what I've got. Let's, let's, I'm going to stop my share and let's have some questions. I'm going to do this. So if, uh, Joanne, do you have some uh, questions that have been put in chat? You're muted. Joanne Barker, you're muted. As I can see, there are no questions. Does anyone have any questions they would like to address to Joan? This was so interesting, Joan. I want to. I can talk a little bit about the erasure. For example, uh, we know that she did. Much, she was at Daisy Bates's place many times because Bates in Little Rock mentions it in her autobiography, and so do some of the students mention her being there. And we know that she was doing uh, filings with Robert Carter. There is an entire monograph studying Cooper versus Aaron, which is the Supreme Court case that came out that uh, eventually said that Little Rock had to desegregate. If you go to the index, you will not find her even in the index. There is a question that came up and it is, let me see. I think it was one about Did children. Did Motley have any peers or advocates for her place? Um, Thurgood Marshall was always a good supporter for her. And uh, she did have the people that she worked with on these various cases uh, thought very highly of her. Uh, also then she turned out to be a wonderful mentor. And so there is a whole younger generation of women, especially women of color, in law that she mentored through uh, various things. And for a while, one of those that she was mentoring was, Sonia, uh, was Sandra Sotomayor, who was a young judge on the court when she was a senior. She also did have a child. Uh, she has a son that was born in 1952 in the middle of all those times when she was riding, traveling all over the South. And um, that was an, uh, one of the reasons that it was hard for her to be away from her family 
um, during those during those long litigation years. Joan, how did you find out about her and what made you want to tell her story? Well, I had run across her in several of the, I, I, among the things I taught uh, was constitutional history. And I'd run across her then. And what surprised me was to find out that she, like Marshall, was an Episcopalian. And how every time I keep, keep continuously tripping over more places and more cases that she was involved in. As, and all of them, as a lawyer, are basically cases where she is trying to get justice done for, for people and to create a more just system in the United States. Did she continue to attend St. Luke's throughout her life or were there um, other Episcopal churches? I don't know where else she attended. I know she obviously had continued to have a connection because when they spent their weekends in Connecticut, uh, they were just outside of New Haven. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that does come up is at one point where there's another lawyer who, on the team who is much more agitated about something that's happened. And somebody asks her, well, why aren't you, you know, all as agitated? And she, she said, well, he's a Baptist and I'm an Episcopalian. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, uh, we take these things calmly. <laughs> right. Well, I believe that we are just at the verge of the end of our time. I want to be sure before we leave to invite you to come next week. We have an exciting uh, presentation on um, Peggy Bosmeyer Campbell, who was a priest in. Arkansas, and she has a wonderful story. And uh, Pan Adams, who will be presenting it, is, is the person to tell us about her life. Um, if you have any more questions that you think of, go ahead and write them down and we'll pass them to Joan and we'll ask Joan to uh, connect with you and, and answer the question. Again, if you would like, this will be on a YouTube. So uh, I think it was written in, in the chat where it is, and that will be sent to you. You will receive this recording since you were registered. Yane, do you have anything else to say? Thank you, Joan, so much. It was so interesting and so informative. I really appreciate you doing this for us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, if there was any confusion about the time, it's 12 o'clock um, Pacific, 1 o'clock Mountain, 2 o'clock Central, 3 o'clock Eastern. So um, we will have this for the next five weeks. And if you have any questions, please write me back to the registration confirmation that you get. It's yane.e.kim at gmail.com. And today's presentation and all the presentations will be available at a later time on our YouTube channel, which I am putting in the chat right now. You can also Google or, or you can also search Episcopal Women's History Project on YouTube and the channel will come up. Thank you, Joan. Yin. Thank you, Joan. Barbara. I want, there is one question very quickly. Yes, there are books about her. There is both, and there is a third, there's a biography about to come out. There's a book on her court cases and her autobiography is mm -hmm. also available. Great. Thank you all. Can you put that in the Joanne, chat? Nice to see your face. Yes, it's good to see you. Uh, I, I'm so excited about the uh, next week's presentation. Yeah, it's going to be great. The ones that are coming after that are equally as exciting. These are this is a potpourri of wonderful, important women that I'm glad you're getting to know. Thank you so much for attending. It's a tough act to follow. Mm -hmm. I would say so, but <laughs> she'll do a good job. I know her. Oh yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Hi, much. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Lynn. Good to see you. Thank you.
Yes, yeah, thank you, Stacey Lina, for the remaining <laughs> presentation. Joke. One of the question in the chat is, can people still sign up? Yes, you can sign up for mm -hmm. any of the remaining sessions. Thank you. Do you have to sign up individually or are you already No, on? once you sign up, the login works for all six sessions. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Stay safe and thank you so much. See you next week. If you stay on the chat, I will look for the registration link. Just a second. Here it is, the registration link. And if you forget about the links, you can register again as many times as you need to, and you'll get a personal registration link. So I put it in the chat. You can register here, and you'll get a confirmation and reg um, Zoom link to these sessions. So please share widely. Thank you for joining. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> There is a new invention that is a goodbye for Zoom that <laughs> shuts you off. <laughs> yeah, we may need it. <laughs>